We're going to spend and talk about some of the very same things we talked about last week because I think it is important for us to, uh, to uh, understand the background of the book of Judges. And I'm going to take in a different approach. And uh, uh, Buzz, if you, Buzz, if you could bring me the, the uh, laser pointer, if you'd bring that to me. I need that today for this part of this class. But uh, I want us to learn to study the Bible. And to do that, there are various ways to study it. Last week, we, we, uh, we talked about it and uh, mentioned some specific places, but didn't, did not uh, really emphasize it. I think one of the best things that, that, that has happened in my life is the uh, uh, use of Bible geography to study the Bible. And that's what I want us to do. We're going to study and say a lot of the things we said last week, but we're going to have some graphics to go with it. And I think, that will, I think that will really, really, really help the situation, um, you know, as, 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 as we go along this way. I've I got to find where the, where the laser button is. Is that the laser button? Yep, I got it. All right, let's get to the book of Judges, and let's, let's just look at a, let's just go ahead and look at a Bible map. Buzz, if you've got that first slide to put it up, the second one is the one we need, and uh, uh, they're behind over there, and it's all my fault, oh, oh, okay? And I just hope, I hope we're all together by the time I pulled all this together. Here's a Bible map. I don't know if your Bible has maps in the back. If, if you know, pick up the Bible, uh, your Bible, and go to, the, go, go to the book of Revelation, and then turn to some more pages. Bible maps. The Bible is a book of history, and, and it, is, it, is, it is a book of geography. I was just pick, checking this Pew Bible to see if it, if, uh, if, if it has Bible maps. And uh, the, this, this Pew Bible I picked up does not have Bible maps. But uh, it'll really help you. What do you see on that map? Well, you see the Bible lands almost every. Can you see the word Egypt? You know where Egypt is? You know that's the African continent. And then, right above that, do you, do you see this blue place right here? That, that little place right there? That's the marker I use when I study Bible New York. That's the Dead Sea. Now, it's, it's misshapen a little bit on this slide, but uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a part of identification. Sometimes the Bible map will zoom in on that part of the Bible, and you won't see Egypt. You'll only see, you see the word Canaan there? That's most Bible maps focus on that part of the Bible. Now then, if I ask you geographically, where does it all begin? Geographically, what is in the beginning? And don't say heaven and earth. I want you to be more specific than that. Places on the earth that are geographically mentioned in the creation story. You know what they are? A Garden of Eden. That's not a geographic place. There are two rivers mentioned in the story of the creation. And, and those rivers, and this, this is that map, is the Euphrates River and the Tigris River. So you got the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. Now, that river, Euphrates, is mentioned repeatedly again in the Bible. If you want to be a good Bible student, you need to know the relationship between the Dead Sea and, uh, uh, and, and, and the river Euphrates. You even need to know the relationship between Egypt and the river Euphrates. And so uh, uh, in the book of Genesis, there, there's another geographic place that we know of, and it is in connection with Noah. Where was the Garden of Eden? Well, nobody knows. The flood changes all of that geography, evidently, but... We know it is in some way associated with two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Nobody knows where the Garden of Eden was. But when you get to Noah, there's another geographical place that is mentioned. You know what that is? 
Where was Noah born? Geography-wise, where was Noah born? Nobody knows. They went out to replenish the earth, and we don't know where Noah was, uh, other than the fact he was in those Bible lands, but we know where the ark landed. Where did the ark land? So as you look at a Bible map, it'll help you to know specifically some places. The Bible said the ark landed, and I guess we'll have to go to that next slide to, uh, to, to get to the, the um, uh, I thought I had another slide there. Okay, the, the, there it is. The, the, the mountains of Ararat are just right up here in this area. We don't know exactly where it is. We know where Mount, what the place that is called Mount Ararat, geographically, you know where that is. You can look that up on any map and you'll see where Mount Ararat was. The ark landed on the mountains of Ararat. So when people are looking for the ark, sometimes they go to Mount Ararat and they're looking for it. And how many times has that been discovered in your lifetime? I mean, you know, uh, you you see all those things that try to sell magazines and things of that nature. The ark has been discovered. The ark has been discovered. Has it or has it not? What difference does it make? If you could touch the Ark of the Covenant, or pardon, if you could touch Noah's Ark, would you believe in the flood any more than you do right now? You know, uh, when I was in Birmingham years ago, I touched a piece of wood that came from the Ark of the Covenant, not from, from the Ark, but from Noah's Ark. Uh, one, of the, one of the ladies, I eventually baptized her, I think her husband was already a Christian, and her father had had financed one of these traps, uh, one of these trips over there looking for, for the ark. And they brought him back a piece of the ark. And uh, it was encased in uh, plexiglass, you know, in that kind of heavy plastic and everything. And somebody had drilled a hole in, that, in the side of that piece of plastic. And I stuck my finger in, and I want you to know I have touched Noah's ark. Do I believe that? I believe everything I've said so far, and no, I've not touched Noah's ark. Why? I don't know where that piece of wood came from. If you'd finance, you know, for a year's expedition over there, and they'd come back with nothing, I think that'd be, that'd be, that would be pretty tragic. So, so let's go to, let's go, yeah, let's, let's go to, uh, to, uh, to that, ne- to that next, to that next, next map, and, uh, uh here is, we talked about where Egypt is and said, uh, uh, there's your marker right there. There's the Dead Sea. So now we got, we got the ark up here and we got all of these things. We got the Euphrates rivers over here. Let's come down this way and there's the land of Egypt. Now, Egypt is, uh, is really, really an important place to us. And, and we need to understand the uh, importance of that place. Uh, if, if you look at it, you'll, you'll, come, you'll come to a realization of how the Bible is all related. God selected uh, Abraham. Go back to that previous slide. I believe it has Ur of the Chaldees on it. There, right, right down in this area. That's where Abraham was called. And Abraham went up the river Euphrates, stopped at Haran until his father died, And then he came down into the land of Canaan. So we got Adam, Euphrates, Tigris and Euphrates. We've got Noah, the mountains of Ararat. And we've got Abraham. And now it really becomes geographic. The Lord came to Abraham and said, I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees. And I want you to go to a place that I will show you. He goes first to Haran, his father dies there, and then God comes to him a second time, says, this is not it, go down into that land that I will give to you. And they go down into the land that we call the promised land. Why? Because of the threefold promise God made to Abraham. I'll make of you a great great nation. I'll put the great nation in a great land. And someday I will send a great Savior. Savior. 
If I told you you made that same threefold promise to uh, Isaac, could you help me a little bit better this time? Speak out a little bit louder. God said to Isaac, I'll make of you a great nation. That was not even louder, okay. Uh, I will put that great nation in a great land, and someday I'll send a great, great Savior. He made the same promise to Jacob. Uh, I will make of you a great nation, put that great nation in a great land, and someday I'll send a great, great Savior. And all of a sudden you hit Genesis 12, and the story of the Bible begins to blossom, and it just goes and blossoms page after page. But so Abraham, Abraham left this area down here, went up to Haran first, because that's the Arabian Desert, as you can see there, and then came down into this land of Canaan. Now that land of Canaan has other names. Sometimes in the, in the time of the kings, it's sometimes called Israel. The nation is Israel. Jacob's other name was Israel. But it's the land of Israel. The children of Israel lived in the land of Israel. So when you talk about the promised land, threefold promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, great nation in a great land with a great Savior. Well, what happens when you get down into that land? Well, let's mention one other name, and that is Palestine. Where does that word come from? Evidently, it's a derivation of the word Philistines. And so when you think of that promised land, it's Canaan. It's the land of Israel. When it's divided, it's the land of Israel and Judah. And it is, it is Palestine. So it has all of these names that are applied to it. And, and the way biblically to think about it, it's the promised land. So God says to Abraham, you're not, you can walk over this and you'll, you'll have, you, you will, uh, every bit of the land your feet step on, it'll be yours. He says pretty much the same thing to Jacob. Walk all up over this land and every place your feet, foot, uh, feet touch, that'll be yours and your, your, your descendants. But you know the Bible story enough to know that after Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you come to a character named Joseph. What geographical place, nation, is used to refer to, is associated with Joseph. They've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob living up here in the promised land, but Joseph changes nations. And so Joseph is sold as a slave by his brothers down into the land of Egypt. And they're there for 400 years, uh, 430 years to be specific. Let's look at that map of, uh, of Egypt. Uh, yes, this is it right here. There's the land of Goshen where the Jews were allowed to settle. Look how fertile that is. Does that look anything like the land where those uh, uh, my pillow sheets come from? And you, how often have you seen that my pillow? Where's that? That's, over, that's from the land of Goshen. Now he's got a different name of it. He's got a more specific name for it. But uh, that's really a fertile land. So Joseph goes down there and because of the favor of the king, they're given the most, the most, uh, uh, most productive part of the land in some respects. And so they're there 430 years and they become slaves. 430 years later, they leave the land of Egypt. Who leads them out? Who do we associate with uh, that exodus? And that's Moses, isn't it? Moses leads them out. Are you aware that the Bible specifically tells us where the burning bush was found? When Moab was out there and he was taking care of those sheep, you remember at 40 years of age, he left the land of Egypt and, and, uh, uh, and, and so he came way, way over here, keep watching the, watching the porter, 
And guess where the burning bush was? Down there at Mount Sinai. That's how far he fled from Egypt to, to get to escape from the wrath of the king. And it is there, while he's at Mount Sinai, he sees a burning bush. That's remarkable, isn't it? Most individuals are not aware that's where you saw the burning bush. And so God, and I'm not saying Abraham, uh, I should have been saying Moses, that's where Moses fled from Egypt to get down there into, uh, 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 into Mount Sinai, and that's where you saw the burning bush. And God says to Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and lead my people back to this place. You need to know where Mount Sinai is in relationship to the Dead Sea. It's hundreds and hundreds of miles down here till you get to, into the land of Egypt. And Moses, because he was fleeing from where the people lived, there, obviously that's the area where the pyramids are, but you come all the way down here to Mount Sinai. Moses goes back up to lead the Israelites out of that land. I hope you can look at that map and just draw lines in your, uh, in your mind. As you can see, a dotted line that leads him back, back into Egypt. And then you see the Exodus. Now the Exodus says that they crossed the Red Sea. Folks who don't believe the Bible or people who don't really believe the, that you can believe every word of the Bible, they want Moses to cross and lead the Israelites someplace up in this area. Because you remember those, uh, those wheels of those chariots of the Egyptians got stuck in the mud. And there's a swampy place up there. And sometimes, even in your Bible, you'll see the Exodus taking them from this place over here. And they say, well, you can read that word Red Sea as Reed Sea. And so it's a marshy area where there were a lot of reeds. That's foolishness. It was the Red Sea. How do I know that? Because the Bible says they crossed at the Red Sea, not the Reed Sea. And then after they had crossed the Red Sea, sometimes later, they camp again at the Red Sea. What does that mean? It means that when they left the land of Egypt, they came down to the Red Sea. And someplace in this area, being led by Moses, is where the Egyptians uh, came, pursued them. Now the Israelites marched through on dry ground. Well, the wheels of the chariot of the Egyptians get stuck in the mud uh, in the place that they crossed. Somebody says, well, that's the Reed Sea. Are you sure? Because the very book that says their, their wheels got stuck in the mud say that they were all drowned in the Red Sea. You can't drown an entire army in a swampland. And so whenever the Bible says they all drowned, they crossed the Red Sea and they came down. There's the some places, and it's, it's before, I believe, there if you get to Mara, but it's about in this place. They encamp again, and the Bible says they encamped again at the Red Sea. And so uh, the story of the waters opening up at, uh, uh, at the Red Sea is really, really important. Now they arrive at Mount Sinai, and the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob what was Jacob's other name? Israel. Israel. The children of Jacob, the children of Israel leave the land of Egypt and come uh, uh, down toward Mount Sinai because Moses is leading them and they get to Mount Sinai and the children of Jacob, children of Israel, and every time you read the expression children of Israel in the Bible, your mind needs to say, hey, they're talking about somebody's kids. 
That's Jacob's kids. It's his descendants. It's a nation. And they become a nation. They even number them there. There's a book in the Bible that talks about the fact they numbered them. Uh, anybody want to guess the name of the book of the Bible that tells about them numbering the people? How did you get that? You are so brilliant and so sharp today. It's the book of Numbers. And so you've got Exodus, exiting from the land of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, coming down to Mount Sinai. And while they're there, they receive not only the Ten Commandments, they receive the teachings of the book of Leviticus. Leviticus, named after the tribe of Levi. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Now, in many respects, Leviticus sort of bores us whenever we read it. There's this trespass offering, there's this burnt offering, there's this sin offering, and there's all of these details about which part of the animal you offer for every purpose. Or, and and they sometimes would burn the whole animal. Sometimes they would only burn a part of the animal. Sometimes they uh, would only bring their sacrifice and wave it before God. Wouldn't burn any of it. Uh, and, and, and we find that rather uh, confusing to us. But a babe in Christ in Birmingham said, Anybody that says it doesn't make any difference to how you worship God has not read the book of Leviticus. Isn't that amazing? You've got an entire book, at least the historical part is the first 20 chapters. You've got the last 20 chapters of Exodus talking about, how, uh, about the events that happened. And then you've got an entire book that tells them how to worship God. One uh, redneck fellow said, I tried to read, read the Bible through, and I was not good. I read Genesis. I read Exodus. And then when I got to uh, uh, leave it to cuss, that's what I did. I quit re- trying to read the Bible through. Uh, Levites, sacrifices, and they number the people. They're there for a year. They build a tabernacle, and they leave this place, and they head, head up right up to this place called Kadesh Barnea, right up there. There's the Dead Sea. They're right on the southern edge of the promised land. And they send spies out from Kadesh Barnea. And the spies go up here into the land of Philistia. You see the word Philistines there. Into the promised land. And they come back and says, it's a land that flows with milk and honey, but we're not able to take it. So the Lord says to Moses, I'm going to destroy every one of them. And so for the next 40 years, you'll wander around in this wilderness area here. You'll wander in this wilderness area here. And at the end of 40 years, they come back up to Kadesh Barnea and they number the people a second time. Wonder what book in the Bible I would read about where they numbered the people the second time. Well, the name of the book is not number singular, it's numbers with an S, and there's 40 years covered in the book, in that book. When they get back up and they count the people, do a census a second time, everybody's dead that had left the land of Egypt. And there are only two of men of war above 20 years of age who left the land of Egypt, who eventually go into the promised land, and that's Joshua and Caleb. I hope you can look at this map and you can see the outline of the Bible. Ur of the Chaldees is not shown on this map. Do you know where it is? If you came up here, uh, if you came up here to the promised land and came across the, uh, across that Arabian desert and get right over here, there's Ur of the Chaldees. There, there is, is the Tigris and Euphrates River way up in this area. So Abraham leaves Ur, goes up the Tigris and Euphrates, comes down to the promised land, and in his descendants, in Joseph's day, come down to the land of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, they come to Mount Sinai, they come to Kadesh Barnea, and for 40 years they wander in the wilderness, they come back to Kadesh Barnea, and they want to go into the promised land. When they get to Kadesh Barnea, uh, 
they want event. They, here's what they want to do. They want to come right over here to get to the promised land. Instead of going in this route, they want to go in, go in this way. God now has a plan for them to go in this way. There's a nation there called the Edomites. Edom. Do you know anybody in the Bible who has a, na a name? Edom has four letters. This other guy has four letters in his name, and it also starts with an E. The second letter is S. And I hope you saw the difference between Edom and Esau. They're the descendants of Jacob's brother. And so these cousins arrived back up here and they said, can we come across here? And any damage we do to your land, any, 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 any uh, problem, uh, we'll pay you for it. We've got enough money. We brought all that gold out of the land of Egypt. We've got, uh, you know, the evidence they had that gold was when they built that tabernacle and overlaid it with gold. We'll just pay you for it. And the Edomite says, there is no way that you can do that. And so the Bible says that what happened was, instead of going this route, going from Kadesh Barnea through Edom and Moab and up in this land to this promised land, see there's the Dead Sea, coming back up into this area, they have to come all the way down to this other part. The Red Sea has, uh, at the northern end, is divided into two seas. There's the Red Sea, but this is also the Red Sea. And, and then there's a massive Red Sea that is down, down in this area. Uh, but they have to come all the way down to Ezion Geber. What is interesting is that that place is mentioned again later in the Bible, Ezion Gezer, because that's where Solomon's ships docked. Remember Solomon? Solomon had, had, a, had, a, had a set of vessels that left Ezon Geber, came down to the Red Sea, and came all the way over here to India. They went to Africa and they went to India. And so the Bible talks about geography in relationship to Sodom, and it's the same place. They came down this way, and they had to come around the land of Edom and then get up to the land of Moab, into that promised land. And, and so uh, once, once, uh, they, uh, uh, once you get to this part of the Bible, there's some things, and you'll be seeing some of the slides now that we had last week, but let me encourage you, as you read the Bible, use those maps. It'll help you remember the order in which things happen. I mean, I, I, I can look at that map. Can you not? Can you not know where, where uh, the mountains of Ararat are? Can you not know where the Garden of Eden was? You know, it's, it's not on that map, but in relationship to the Dead Sea, can you see where that place is? Can you see Abraham leaving Ur of the Chaldees down, to the, down uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Iraq and, and coming up the Euphrates River? Yeah. So I guess that's Iran maybe uh, instead of Iraq. Anyway, you go up into that, up into that land. And can you not see them go down to the land of Egypt? Can you see them come out? Can you see Mount Sinai in your mind? Can you see them come to Kadesh Barnea, sending the spies out? And they said, we cannot do it. And so the Lord says, you're going to die in the wilderness. And that whole nation died. Well, a whole nation of those who left the land of Egypt. And only two adult men who were 20 years and above, capable of going to war, went into that promised land. Now then Moses lives for 120 years. Who takes Moses' place? And that is Joshua 
takes Moses' place and Joshua takes them into the promised land. Now then, I want you to look where, I'll go back to that previous slide where we've got the, red, the, 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 uh, the Dead Sea. The next slide that we're going to look at will come right up here. They come up on this side and we're going to look at the next, next slide that we'll look at will be the one that comes right up here. There they are. There's Edom, Ezi and Gebers down here, and they come back up this land, and, and Joshua leads them into the promised land. That's the book of Joshua. What happens? Well, it takes them about seven years to get that promised land. Uh, if I tell you Joshua was one of the men who left the land of Egypt, can you tell me who the other one is? Joshua and Caleb. Oh, those two men were spies when they came to Kadesh Barnea the first time. When they got up to Kadesh Barnea the first time, they sent out 12 spies. Guess who they sent? Well, they sent 10 others, but they sent Joshua and Caleb. They came back the first time and says it flows with milk and honey, but we're not able to do it. And Joshua and Caleb said, you are as wrong as you can be. You're absolutely wrong. And so they go into the promised land. And if you can see the Dead Sea, most Bible maps that you'll have in the back of your Bible concern this geographical part of the Bible. Now you'll see, sometimes you'll see it divided differently. You didn't have the tribal association with it when Jesus lived on this earth. You did not have the tribal association with it per se after Solomon dies. You know, and when you get to the New Testament, it's totally different. It's only that southern part of that promised land that Jesus, where Jesus was born and where he did so much of his preaching there and in the northern part called Galilee. So you've got that. They come into that promised land, and, and, and uh, if, if you look uh, in, that, in, in that promised land, here's what the Lord told them to do, and here's what they did not do. Look at the Bible verses in Deuteronomy chapter 20. This is Moses. Days, just a matter of days, a max of a month before he died, Moses says to the Jewish nation, now this is one 40 years later that says we cannot take the land when they get to Kadesh Bar, or the, uh, uh, the first time they get to Kadesh Barnea. But of the cities of these people which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let, let nothing that breathes remain alive. The Lord says, clean it out. When you get into that land, wipe it out. Don't you leave anything, men, women, and children, you kill them every one. Well, God sure is mean. No. You remember God sending the flood because every man was wicked? Guess how wicked those people in that land world, how, how wicked they were. Almost as wicked as the people in Noah's day. Nature of God hasn't changed. And when the Lord comes back, how many people are going to, who walk the narrow way are going to be those who entered into heaven? Just few, few there be that find it. And so it's not for us to evaluate the nature of God. It's for us to accept that's the way he is. Now then, why did the Lord make them forfeit the land? He says, because they have turned to idolatry and sexual immorality. He said, they're going to forfeit 
their right to this land. That's why they lost it. And they, the Lord specifically mentions in the book of Leviticus that when men were lying with men, homosexuality, God brings judgment. That's what they were doing in the land of the, uh, in the promised land. That's what those Gentile nations were doing. And in the book of Levit Leviticus, chapters, I guess it's 22, 18 says, I will vomit, that land will vomit you out but will vomit the people out of that land. And like the great fish vomited out uh, Jonah, the Lord says those people have messed up my land and the land's going to vomit them out. Then he says to the Jews, now when you get there, if you don't serve God, it's going to vomit you out. His nature hasn't changed. And it's important for us to recognize that. Well, what did they do when they got the promised land? Well, look at these, look, look, look at these verses from Joshua chapter 1. He says in verse 27, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants. They put the Canaanites under tribute. That's in verse 27. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. Nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kithron. 31, nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Acho, nor did Namthali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, and they could not even live down in the valley where the fertile land might have been. They didn't drive them out. So when they get into the promised land, Joshua dies, and when he dies, is where we come to the book of Judges. And I've taken time today to teach a lot of what I taught last week because this is the story of the book of Judges. As long as the people are in that promised land, look at the cycle of the Judges. As long as they're there, think of the face of a clock. And as long as Joshua is alive in that generation, they are faithful to God. Put faithful up there at 12 o'clock. Guess what happens? Instead of wiping out all the inhabitants and wiping out even their language and the names of their gods, they'll, they would not drive them out and they kept the names of their gods. And so the Israelites, following the death of Joshua and that generation, turns to idolatry. So on the clock, three o'clock, put idolatry. When they turn to idolatry, the Lord brings nations on them and punishes them until they cry out to God. And when they repent, you look at 12 o'clock, you've got faithfulness, three o'clock, idolatry, repentance, and what does the Lord do? He bring, brings up a deliverer. And that's the story of the book of Judges. There are 15 judges. In the, in 13 of them are mentioned in the book of Judges. And that's what we'll be looking at. Some of them only get one or two verses. You know the names of some of the others. If you're left-handed, you probably know the name Ehud. If you're a woman, you probably know the woman judge, Deborah. You know? What about Gideon? Oh, yeah, I've heard of Gideon. What about Samson? And what about Eli and Samuel? 350-year period of history. But I've spent two weeks giving us the background so that when we get over here and we see all of the things that are happening and when they go in and they do wipe out some of the cities and destroy everybody in it, you need to understand it has to do with the nature of God because the land, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And if we don't behave ourselves in America, where are we headed? The Lord turns into hell every nation that forgets him.
That's it for today. We'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll take up this uh, uh, with the study of specific judges.